good to be with you again. I know some famous American psychiatrists said that American Catholics are so lucky to be able to talk about saints, men and women who have lived the human life, know what it's all about, know its good points and weaknesses, limitations, and are now shining examples of what we believe in, what we teach. And I think especially the month of August is so replete with so many wonderful examples of the holy ones who've gone before us. I mentioned last time St. Alphonsus Liguri on feast on August the 1st, the founder of the Redemptorist, the great teacher of moral theology. And on August 4th, we always celebrate a feast that's very special to me, uh, the feast of St. John Vianney the patron saint for all of us parish priests. He was born three years before the French Revolution broke out, so he grew up in a very turbulent time, a time when many were turned against the church, which they identified with the old regime of the king and nobility. And so we know that his first communion took place in his family home, with a priest who was secretly gotten there from other areas to celebrate a mass in the home, lest they be discovered by the authorities. We know that he was drafted into the armies of Napoleon, like almost all the other French young men. And since he had no desire for killing, <laughs> He went AWOL, he went into the mountains of southern France to hide until Napoleon fell and he was able to come out of hiding. We know he received his confirmation like hundreds of others gathered in a town square, so many people to be confirmed because the bishops had not been allowed for so many years to do their work. He uh, entered the seminary to prepare for the priesthood, but the authorities debated about whether to ordain him because he just wasn't a good student. He just didn't have very much uh, intellect. And they were afraid he was going to embarrass the church in that age of the Enlightenment. So they finally decided we'll ordain him, but send him to some godforsaken little place where he, at least he won't embarrass the church. So they sent him to the little town of Ars, <clears throat> northeast of the great city of Lyon, uh, near to the border with Switzerland. Some years ago, uh, I was in France with my mother we had rented a car and driving around, and I was determined I wanted to visit the place where he lived and worked. I was able to even get a map that was put out by the French government and had all of the places on it indicated, which were great religious sites, sites of devotion and pilgrimage. Nowhere could I find ours. So I found a little town on a greater map of France and went there. And I thought it must be much like it was in his day, a very simple, poor little town. We were able to stay overnight in a motel, a hotel, a old French type hotel, which I guess was used years ago by pilgrims. And when you entered the church that St. John served, they obviously had broken out the back of the little church to extend it because he brought so many people back to the practice of the Catholic faith. And then when he died, they broke through the wall again in the back to add another larger marble-coated shrine to St. John. I was able to celebrate Mass there on two occasions, and uh, in the uh, new modern, more uh, elaborate shrine, uh, the remains of St. John are in a casket of 
glass and gold up above the, one of the side altars. At one point, as I was about to go out to celebrate the little mass with my mother, I had the English words and all for the mass. The black sacristan, I guess from Africa, said in French to me that he had given me to celebrate mass with the chalice that St. John Vianney himself used in celebrating mass. Wow. What an honor that was to celebrate Mass using the very chalice St. John used. We know in his own very simple way, by prayer and penance, he began to attract people back to Christ and the church. And soon the word was spreading from that little village, and people recognizing we have in our midst a saint. And the word spread to other villages and towns and cities. And soon people were coming from all over France, all over Europe, to go to confession to this simple priest. It got to the point where the authorities in Paris were wondering, what's going on down there in ours? Why do we have to provide so many trains to take people to and from that little town. What's going on down there? Are they plotting a revolution to bring back the king and the nobles? No, it's just all these people going there to go to confession. And we're told that people would take a whole week of vacation, uh, come there, get off the train, get a number and wait. They might have to wait all week before they were able to make their confession. He got to the point where he was spending 11 hours a day during the winter time, but 16 hours a day during the summertime hearing confessions. Yes, the priests that they were so afraid might <laughs> embarrass the church became his great symbol of serving God's people, the very effective minister of the sacraments. August 4th is the day we honor him. On the 9th of August, we celebrate a lady who was known once as Edith Stein, born in Germany, late 1800s, and growing up as a Jew, but became very interested in philosophy and was led to read the writings of St. Teresa of Avila, the great mystic from the 1500s. So she became a Catholic, a Christian, and even joined the Carmelite order. And so when the Nazi regime came to power and began to arrest people of Jewish ancestry, she was transferred to Holland to a convent there. But when the Nazis conquered Holland, then she was arrested and sent to Auschwitz, where she died, St. Benedicta Christi of the Cross. And another saint of the same time, August 14th is his feast, St. Maximilian Kolbe, a Polish priest, Franciscan, conventional, and after all his work, he too was arrested and put in a concentration camp. And the Nazis had a policy, apparently, that if one prisoner in a compound violated the rules or ran away, then one of the others had to be punished. And so they selected some man who was to be put to death. And St. Maximilian Kolbe seeing this man breaking down in tears because of his wife and his children, he offered to take his place. And so indeed, he was put to death in Auschwitz. When I had the opportunity to visit Auschwitz on one of the tours in Poland, there was the candle left by Pope St. John Paul II at the place where he was put to death in the prisons. 
both he and Edith Stein, witnesses to Christ, even to death. And of course, on the 18th of August, we celebrate a great feast for us, St. Helena. I've often thought, people say women didn't have much of a place in the church. She is one of those who disproves that theory. We know that she was born probably about the year 250 in what we call Asia Minor, right across from where we now know the city of Istanbul, Constantinople is. She grew up as a pagan, was married to a young Roman general, very uh, eager to succeed and rise in the ranks, Constantius. And so they were married, they had one son, Constantine. But in time, Constantius decided to make his move to become the next Roman emperor. And some suggested to him, get rid of Helena, she's too ordinary. She's not connected to the right families in Rome. And so she was abandoned. Fortunately, her son Constantine, who had now become the leading Roman general in that area, uh, Tria, Germany, along the Rhine River, uh, holding the frontier against the barbarians, uh, Constantine took care of her. I know some years ago when I was there in Tria, the guide mentioned they had just discovered the remains of the home in which Constantine and Helena lived. In time, in the year 312, when she was about 60 years of age, Helena decided to become a Christian. And that was only about five years after the last of the great 10 persecutions of the church. Still a very dangerous time to be a Christian. And I suppose she talked to her son about things because maybe this would embarrass him in his uh, efforts to keep rising in the ranks. And now, she talked to him obviously not only about Jesus, but about his cross. Because in the very same year that she became a Christian, 312, he made his move to become the next emperor. And he claimed to have had a vision, seeing the vision of the cross with the words in hoc signo vinces, by this sign you will conquer. And it's just amazing to me when I think of it that the cross would have been a sign of death, defeat, disgrace. Only the worst criminals were crucified. And when he told his soldiers going into battle against his rival that they should put the sign of the cross on their helmets and their shields, I think many of them must have said, are you crazy? This is a sign of defeat. But yes, they conquered. And Constantine became the emperor and immediately ended the persecutions of the Christian church. For the first time, Christians were able to come out of their catacombs and be in public. And I can just imagine Helena with him in Rome, suggesting that as a gift to his mother, he might take one of these pagan temples, now pretty much abandoned, and give it to the Christians, let them use it for a church. And so this is how many of the first churches of Rome began. He even built one on the Lateran Hill, where the Lateran family had a palace, and that became the cathedral of the Church of Rome. And he built another church at the site of where St. Peter would have been buried. Peter crucified, upside down tradition says, in the square of Rome, which is now marked by the obelisk, and buried nearby. And in the 1940s, Pope Pius XII authorized some archeologists to dig under the basilica, under the great dome of St. Peter's, 
And many question whether it was wise to do so that it might undermine the whole thing and cause the dome to collapse. But yes, they found under where the high altar of St. Peter's is, there was a burial area. And these little mausoleums had been knocked down and then covered over with dirt as the city built and rebuilt. And there on some of the slabs of the mausoleum, they found in Greek a sort of uh, writings from the early Christians saying, Peter, I was here. St. Peter, pray for us. All in the writing on these uh, parts of what had been the tomb of St. Peter, right under the main altar of the basilica. Yes, we know that St. Helena had a great influence on her son and on Christian history. In the beginning, uh, Constantine ruled the western half of the empire, so it was in 324 that he made his move to take over the eastern half also, defeating his rival. And it was then possible for St. Helena who is now about 80, to take a ship over to the Holy Land. She wanted to find out where was it that Jesus lived? Where did he suffer and die? Where was he born? And she sent out her aides to find Christians who had passed on the word, this is where Jesus was born. This is where he suffered and died. This is where he was buried. And on each of these places, Helena had a chapel or a church built. She died, we believe, around the year 330, because that is the last time Roman coins bore her image. It was the custom of the Romans to no longer put someone's image on coins being minted once they had died. She is our great patroness. And if anyone has ever gone to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or seen it on TV, if you see the Pope celebrating Mass at the High Altar, off to the right in the shadows, you will see the statue of St. Helena carrying the cross. It's on one of the four great pillars that support the great dome of St. Peter's. Each of the pillars has someone with one of the instruments used in torturing Christ. And so she bears the cross. St. Helena is a great example for all of us to again fall in love with Jesus Christ, the crucified and risen Lord, the one who calls us to take up his cross in our own lives, follow him into eternal life and glory to be assumed into the glory of heaven, even as the Blessed Virgin Mary was assumed into glory. God bless you and your loved ones.